Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles Stories of the Supernatural. And I hope you enjoy this new show, whether you're viewing it on the internet or listening to a podcast version of the episode. I do want to thank you for being part of my audience. You can also find links to videos or podcasts on MiamiGhostChronicles.com as well as where you can submit your story about any eerie experiences you've had, which I would love to hear about. Just go to the Submit Your Story tab. Please subscribe to our channel so that you receive notification of when we release a new show. And find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This is where I usually live stream and where I give you a behind-the-scenes look at locations where new episodes are being filmed at, I also tell you about all the interesting guests that will be appearing soon on Stories of the Supernatural. I hope you enjoy the show, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi everybody, it's Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, Stories of the Supernatural. How are you all doing today? Well, today I am super excited because of the guest I have. This is a super talented and creative lady by the name of Lisa Morton. She is a screenwriter, an author of nonfiction books, award-winning prose writer, and a Halloween expert. I was already telling her, yay, that's my favorite holiday as well, you know, um... And uh, she's a rare Southern California native, and her career as a professional writer began in 1988 with the horror fantasy feature film Meet the Hollow Heads. Uh, she has written more than 100 short stories, including the Bram Stoker Award winning novel, I mean, story uh, titled Tested, uh, which appeared in Cemetery Dance Magazine, and her work has been translated into eight languages as a Halloween expert. She wrote the definitive reference book, The Halloween Encyclopedia, and the multiple award-winning trick-or-treat, A History of Halloween. She currently serves as president of the Horror Writers Association and is also an active member of Mystery Writers of America, International Thriller Writers, and Sisters in Crime. She lives in North Hills, California, and her website is www.lisamorton.com. So, Lisa, how are you doing today? Great, Marlene, and thanks for reading all of that. Of course, of course. Uh, You know, I want the people that are listening to this to be as excited as I am about, you know, um, having you as a guest. And Lisa, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you what I ask all my guests just to start this. Um, Obviously, uh, you you write uh, the nonfiction books, uh, the Halloween, but did you, how did this... um, interest started with the paranormal or Halloween was it something that happened to you as a child or after you became an adult you know I I it um in terms of happening to me as a kid kind of but I came at it through fiction and movies I've always loved horror movies my parents loved horror movies I mean when I was when I was a kid we used to watch all the universal monster movies together and yes and Halloween was a big deal for us um Mm -hmm. it was uh kind of a whole thing that we got into making my costumes and yes um so it was a big deal for me. And so everything else in terms of paranormal has just kind of sprung from that. Okay. And I don't know. Uh, I think, I mean, I even remember I, I had similar and uh, my mom, especially, and this was still when the, they had drive-ins <laughs> and um, I remember going to see, you know, especially like in the seventies when they would come out with those uh, B slasher or creepy movies and go to the drive-in to see them. And, um, I understand exactly what you mean as far as when you have a parent <laughs> that likes it, so you kind of get introduced to it. Um, so, and so what happened? You here you are. You have a childhood interest in it. Obviously, you know your family had it, and you know. But a lot of people have that as a child, and then when they grow up into an adult, they go off in another direction. Uh, was there something uh, uh, something significant that happened after 
became an adult that you said, you know, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to write about. Yes, boy, you nailed that. Um, when I was 15, I saw a little movie called The Exorcist. Oh, you, my God, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> and and uh, it was just out in theaters. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm old enough now that I was a kid when that came yes. out, but I was around when mm -hmm. they had massive crowds and, you know, lines at the theaters night after night yes. for this. And um, I, I was very young. And up until that point, I had kind of wanted to do something like be an anthropologist. But I went into this theater and it was a huge theater and it was sold out and it was packed with you know hundreds of people uh -huh. and what what amazed me was the way people responded to this movie and it's it's hard to explain now because there has not been another movie that I've ever seen that had that kind yes. of audience reaction I mean people screamed and fled and fainted and mm -hmm. it was I I watched the audience more than I watched the movie the first time I think and and within two hours you know of that um, from beginning of that movie to the end my whole life changed and I said I want to do that I want to have that kind of effect <laughs> on people let me tell you something I, I remember what you're saying because the theaters were back then everybody thinks now these multiplex theaters but I remember I, I by the way I, I was 13 I went with my uncle and I lied to my mom because my mom had told me don't go see that movie because you know I'd already have been making the papers of people like basically like passing out and all that and all the hype that went with it and I remember this was uh, I remember when we were there was a line standing to get tickets and then there was a line of people trying to get in Right. And yeah. I remember I was standing with my aunt, my uncle, and I'm another cousin. And, you know, they were letting people out a side door, you know, as they would exit. And I remember standing there and I was like, oh, yeah. and I see a bunch of guys, they leaving. And, you know, when they let the crowd out, the last crowd that I've seen, and they're laughing. And I think to myself, well, it can't be that bad. They're laughing. Little, later on, I realized in life that sometimes guys, when they're nervous, will laugh. Right. So, <laughs> there's about four guys laughing, you know, as they're leaving. I'm like, oh, it can't be that bad. Oh my God. About 20 minutes later, I was like, I can't see this. I, I think I looked, my screen was at my feet. I was so scared of that film afterwards. It took me a couple of months to get over it. And then of course I had to confess to my mom that I'd lied and gone to see a movie because I went to sleep in her room with her. <laughs> so oh, I was yeah, busted. Excellent. I was busted. But yeah, yeah, it, that, that, that definitely, you're absolutely right. That was the movie that took it from I don't know if it was a subject matter or because it was so well made. I don't know what it was, but yeah, I know a lot of people got really affected by it just beyond that first night. Because some people see a scary movie and they'll be scared maybe that night, but then that's it. And um, yeah, I became kind of obsessed with it and I studied it at length. And, and it really is. I mean, there every aspect of that movie is great, but it, it all comes back to the screenplay. And, of course, the screenplay goes back to the original novel as well. And, okay. and the writing on that was so magnificent. And that was kind of why I ended it up after that. I went back to my school counselors and said, I'm going to go into film in college and they were horrified okay. um i was i was like this bright kid who was who scored really high on um uh, aptitude test for the sciences and they kept saying no 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 you're going oh. into that and uh i said no uh, -uh i want to be a screenwriter and so that was what i ended up majoring in yeah. in college follow your passion and, exactly um, and this is and um <clears throat> i remember at that time that film uh, besides the scary part, I remember it was very controversial. I remember priests coming out and saying people shouldn't go see this movie. I mean, it really caused a stir. People don't realize it unless you were around back then. How controversial the film was besides the fact that some, I mean, I heard different versions of people running around saying they were possessed and people like uh, falling down and or having to be carted off in the middle of the movie. And um, even now, after so many years, you just have a lot of people that haven't seen it. And the first time they see it, they're kind of like, even though we become a little bit more jaded as far as horror movies are concerned, you know, as far as being an impact, it still packs a punch, let me tell you, when you see that movie. Yeah, oh yeah, it's still, I mean, you can't take away from how extraordinarily well made that movie is. And uh, do you think also, uh, do you think it had also some of it was that it was based on a true story that it scared people also as much as it did? 
Oh, I think so. I mean, uh, the the true story aspect, um, you know, obviously there was a mm-hmm. lot of dramatic license taken with that. But that true story feel is in the movie. The movie has a sort of almost documentary-like feel to parts of it. And I think that was part of the effect it had on people. They felt like they were watching something really very real. And, and of course, it hit at a time in our culture where um, religion was kind of starting to change in the United yes. States. And so I think it affected people deeply there too. It made them sort of look at their own values in a way that nothing else had done before. Right. And uh, yeah, it almost um, when you looked at it, it, it was almost like, um, almost like no matter how innocent you were, as in the case of, you know, the, 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 the role that Linda Blair uh, played, which was, here's an innocent teenage girl um, living a very sheltered and upscale life and uh, she gets you know basically visit upon a demonic possession and it makes you wonder was it happenstance that she was picked or was it because this demon wanted a confrontation with this exorcist you know which is what you see in that opening part when he's in the desert and he sees the the statue of the demon Right. So, so it kind of makes you wonder why she was the one, even though the, I know they made reference and I'm talking here off the top of my head. There's a lot of it. I don't remember was that she has supposedly been uh, playing with the Ouija board and so on and so forth. But still, it makes you wonder why she was the one that was picked. And now what is it? A year ago, they came out now with a series about it as well, where she's a grown up. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm talking about, that the effect of the exorcist is still, that's what after 40 years, it's still affecting people um and when i know that um for example where do you get your inspiration from and the reason why i say this is for example they say that uh when uh hitchcock did psycho he was looking at the crimes of ed gein and um god knows we have sometimes a lot of what aberrant behavior in human beings to get um inspiration from do you do that when you're writing some of your stories sometimes sure i mean for me the inspiration can come from anywhere um for example i think my last couple of stories dealt with um the house i live in now i moved to this house about three years ago Uh and uh the house is next to a wash okay the wash is kind of inexplicably creepy <laughs> to me. It's this okay. you know, big concrete channel behind the house really? that's almost always dry because I live in Southern California. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of, it goes nowhere apparently. And, you know, it's a, it's a weird creepy thing where you, and also animals use this wash to travel. And so okay. we'll, we'll find like coyotes in our yard and we know they've come up through that wash. And, wow. and I, you know, so when you, that happens, you start thinking, well, what if other things started coming in through that wash? Sure. Um, yes, yeah. absolutely. So, and uh, at this house, I also got very interested in gardening, which I'd never really been before because I had spent the last uh, 28 years in an, an apartment where, you know, you okay. don't have access to that stuff. And, and you're working in the garden and you see like weird weird mushrooms growing and you just think what what is that <laughs> you know so that becomes a story and okay. um yeah for me just about anything can develop into a story let me ask you have you ever written a story that it started scaring you that you had to stop it for a bit has that ever happened to you yes and that's always a good sign <laughs> yeah you're on the right track huh yeah, there have been a few that I wrote that were starting to disturb me. And, you know, at first you kind of have that thing where you think, oh, my God, what are people going to think when they read this? And maybe mm-hmm. I should pull back. And then you realize that oh, that's the exact reason I need to keep going with this. Yeah, because it's like, it's like, wow, I didn't know I had that darkness in me, but let's let's use it. Great. Because right. yeah. a lot of people, a lot of writers sometimes, well, they don't they don't want to go there, like you said, because they find it disturbing themselves and they're like, Okay, that's too dark for me. Um, right. But hey, and and I think um and and you you know you made mention of um of what's happening in your watch. Sometimes I don't know, my experience sometimes what's most frightening is what's left to your imagination almost in a way where that does the deed sometimes much better than something that's too graphic. Um where sure. 
it's kind of like an open-ended, like, at least me, I have a great imagination, so I can really dream up some really horrific things. Uh, if there's something there that's left like a little bit blurry as far as exactly what it is. Um, and now let me ask you, considering that you do this type of writing, have you ever had a true paranormal experience? That you you know, I, I, I can't say that I have. And, and it's one of those things that I would love to be able to say, yes, I had this very strange thing happen. And mm -hmm. um, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Ghost to Haunted History. Okay. And it's a, a comprehensive um, study of ghosts throughout history and around the world. And for that, I wanted to experience as much as I could in terms of like paranormal investigations. Okay. So I participated in a number of them. And it was very interesting to me that I would be sitting in a room in, um, for example, uh, an outbuilding at the Stanley Hotel in Colorado, which is supposed to be very, very haunted. Okay. And um, I participated in an all night paranormal investigation there. And at one point at like 3.30 in the morning, I was in this completely dark room with about 12 other people and they were all experiencing things. And I mean, being touched and hearing things. And, and I was getting none of this. And it does make me wonder if there isn't some sort of neurological ability or something in the brain that it gives some people more of a sort of sensitive nature to this stuff. Um, because this has happened to me a couple of times. I also did an overnight investigation on the queen mary in long beach which mm -hmm. is also supposed to be haunted and right. i was again standing there with good friends who did this with me and they were experiencing things and nothing for me um and i do not doubt their experience by the way okay so it it makes me wonder you know why it is that some of us seem to be more able to experience these things it's one of my big questions after and it became a big question for me during and after the writing of that book you know, I've, because I've done a, a paranormal investigation as well since the 90s, and I have been in similar circumstances where you'll have one person having experiences and the, uh, some other people n not. Uh, sometimes it's, sometimes, believe it or not, it's just, it has to do a lot of, uh, you know, um, with what's really going, if, and this is a big, if there really is any type of paranormal event going on or any paranormal agency uh, sometimes it's true. Some people are more sensitive. Sometimes it's you might have an entity that likes or dislikes one or one or the either of the sexes, or there's some type of connection, as in the look. Um, and uh, to be perfectly honest with you, and, and I'm glad you mentioned it, that you knew the the other people that you were in the group with, because sometimes I've been in groups that I think people kind of amp themselves up. Right. Um, right. Not so much when I've been on investigations, but with people that aren't trained where they anticipate too much and if they were in any other place they wouldn't say that it was paranormal in other right. words but if you're in a supposedly haunted location or some place that's got a history of this kind of thing it's almost like oh yeah you know I got touched it really might be gas I guess that's what I'm trying to say <laughs> You know, sometimes, and um, I'm not going to say all the time, but sometimes, and you might just, uh, you might just have also really, really, really strong boundaries. Maybe more than you know. Maybe more than you right. know. Uh, well, I'm a, I am a definitely a lifelong skeptic, but I'm the kind of skeptic who wants to remain open to possibilities mm -hmm. of things. And so when I, in fact, it was interesting when I started writing this book, I was very skeptical in terms of, oh, I don't know that I believe anyone has really seen this. I think it's all the power of suggestion and right. psych, psych, psychological things going on. By the time I was done with the book, after compiling, you know, centuries of, of things happening to people and um, all kinds of, uh, just tens of thousands of descriptions and so forth, you know, I ended up kind of revising my skepticism a little bit insofar as there obviously is something going on. I'm just not completely convinced myself that it involves the spirits of the dead. So okay. um, I'm still open to the possibility, but at this point I want a little bit more proof. Well, you know, and, and, and I tell people, a lot of people think that when you're a paranormal investigator, your skepticism is non-existent. I right. tell everybody, I'm the worst skeptic. I want to <laughs> rule out any other possibility. 
because I have experienced something that I can't explain. So I, I, that's my the last thing I jump to. I want to, for my own, this is just for my own, um, my own peace of mind, if you want to call it that. I want to rule out possibly anything else that it could be that has a natural origin. Right. That's what I'm saying. I'm a, I'm a skeptic up to a point, despite what I do, because so that if I ever get to that conclusion, it's because, okay, now I have really good proof or something's happened that there's no denying that this has got a supernatural origin. Sometimes, uh, in some cases, there is, it's, some, it's caused by individuals in the family, as in PK, not really necessarily ghosts. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it's residual stuff. Um, for example, uh, I've had people that they'll move into a location and like they said, they... Uh, let's say the family goes into crisis or the, the couple, they start having more fights and, you know, it takes off from there. Nowadays, especially with a lot of the shows that are out, a lot of the reality shows that are out there. And I know sometimes it's really hard to document it, but a couple of cases I've come across where the people there find out through neighbors or, or through some other connection that the people that used to live there before had a lot of dysfunction, in other words. Mm, so basically what you're looking at, it's, almost like a residual something that's imprinted itself in the fabric of that place because i'm not talking about a couple of arguments that happens everywhere i'm talking about a really high level of dysfunction sometimes uh domestic violence a lot of arguing and um and that i found that in some cases that doesn't print in places and then when you have a family that comes in who've never had these type of problems and they start experiencing it a lot of times they they want to say, oh, um, is it paranormal? It is and it isn't. It is in the sense of, of what would happen there, but not really because there's a ghost or anything else like that that's affecting right. them. Because a lot of people think of that also, you know, that uh, that they it's it's uh, like I said, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna blame it on Hollywood. You know, a lot of the shows make it seem like when people start behaving or they start having problems that it's something's like the ghost or you know that that kind of deal it's like not not all the time um but uh and and that's a a a lot of the times i don't know if you've um if you've seen some of these shows they uh, and i've known of some places or some families in other words that have had experiences for years and years and years and those are the ones that i think that are most interesting because when you speak to them and they start giving you uh, a laundry list of events or things that have happened throughout the years that for some reason, whether they were embarrassed or they didn't want to, or they thought that they could deal with it. It's like, I don't know how they could stand it for so long. And sometimes that gives you a good idea that there is something going on there. And uh, inevitably, when you do a little bit of investigation into the background of either the house, the building, or even the land that it sits on, there was something that went on there. In right. many cases, pretty horrific as well. Uh which is almost like the premise, like you said, of the Stanley Hotels. As far as the, the Shining story, it makes you think that all these horrible things had happened there throughout the years and it was still uh, impacting uh, what happened in the stories. Or, well, let me ask you, and, and I'm curious about this, in the, you know, in the, in the, in the Shining, uh, do you think it's it was the prior events as described or was it because a case of reincarnation for Jack because that's what you think of at the very end when it shows that him dressed as a waiter oh right right in In the the bar yeah yeah that makes you think oh that's why all of this happened why he ended up here because he had been there before Um, my take on that was it was kind of fate um, you know, I, reincarnation, yeah, I guess maybe that would be the more logical <laughs> explanation in a way, but um, I felt like it was almost like saying that he, he was fated to go through this. Um, yeah, I, and you know, now I'm trying to remember what it does with the end of the book as compared to the movie. Oh my God, I read that book so many years ago. You're absolutely right. right. I read it a long time ago. Um but yeah, it was almost like to the very end, you're thinking, okay, was it, was it the hotel was haunted because of all these tragedies? Uh, in other words, that would he get, that he get, did he get possessed by the last um, guy that stayed there to take care of it, that killed his daughters? 
Right. And then yeah. at the end, it zooms in. It shows him like as a waiter in 1921 or something like that. I was like, what? Okay. So I don't know if that was Hollywood or part of the original book. <laughs> yeah, I seem to recall that being not part of the book. Um, so okay. that seemed to be maybe a little extra stab that Stanley Kubrick stuck in there. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. That was, kind of left you a little bit like, huh? Okay. Right. But um, let me ask you, what do you... Um, as far as uh, I mean, you, you you've also your your most a lot of your books are nonfiction. Um, as far as uh, how can I say it? Because I as, lately I've been reading a lot of the really like uh, older uh, novels, like short stories and things like that. Like some of the Victorian stuff, like Edith Wharton and M. R. James and all these things. And now I look at them and they they seem like pretty tame, you know, as far as scary, even though they were. Uh, they were very well written. Um, do you think that all this uh, over ghost paranormal stuff that we're getting thrown at us, it makes us less scared or more scared? Well, how do you think it works on as far as uh, when people are producing horror, whether it's fiction or nonfiction or true crime? I, You know, I don't think people have changed significantly or probably ever will in terms of we enjoy being scared. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, we like it because it, it's a way to test ourselves in a way, um, in a safe setting, so that you know that you're you're going to go through this experience, whether it's in a movie or in a book, and it's going to be completely safe. And sometimes it might even be funny or um, – it. so I, I think we always – all of us like that to some extent, or, you know, there are people who don't like scary things, obviously, but mm -hmm. that, that, that need for so many of us to test our fears in a sort of playful situation has never changed. And I kind of doubt if it ever will. Um, I, now, where it gets more interesting to me in the, the last like 10 or 20 years is that some of that has morphed into stuff that is genuinely dangerous. Okay. And I find that a really odd phenomena. I don't know if you're familiar with some of the um, Halloween or haunted attractions where now yes. um, it's becoming more common for the monsters, as they call them, or the actors within the haunt to actually touch you. Yes, And some take it so far as to actually for example rough you up even a little bit and i find that really strange that's a new that yes. does feel new to me and i'm not sure exactly what that says about us as a right. as a people i mean i know it's nothing i would ever want to do i like the idea that i can go through one of these things and, and nothing's going to um, touch you nothing's going to touch me it's fun there are fun things to look at somebody jumps out at you and you kind of go on ah, then you mm -hmm. laugh a little bit and it's all fine you know and you know that the exit door is 10 feet away and you're going to go back out into the world and you're going to have this fun memory of doing this and and i don't really want to have a memory of going through a place like that and being you know hauled around and um i mean i've heard of some really outrageous things that they do to people in some of these so that's a that's a really odd and like i said to me that does almost feel like something new in our culture and i'm not sure what that says well and i remember when i was like a teenager they had they they had converted like an old racetrack you know the building like what you said this was like the real life people but absolutely hands off yeah they would come and stand right next to you and look at you you know this was way before uh like uh halloween horror nights uh right. it was great it was scary that in and of itself was really really scary um and but absolutely no touching none right uh, and it's almost like you got scared but you knew you were safe and at some point also, that's why they would, you know, hang stuff, you know, that would drop, you know, like cobwebs or something because it was inanimate, in other words, but it scared you. That was great. It was fantastic. Sure. And, um, but you're, you're absolutely right. I don't know how I'd feel if something like actually grabbed me or touched me. I'd, <laughs> I they probably could hear me scream like three miles away. Uh, I, I love a good scare, but even I have my moments where it's like, no touching, no touching. <laughs> Right. Too real for me. <laughs> Thanks. You're, right, exactly. Yeah, you've taken me out of the fantasy element yes, now. Yes, exactly. And, and do something more real. And I don't I don't really want to do that. <laughs> exactly. No, it's, 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 uh, yeah, and I, I know what you mean as far as that. There's a lot of places that have taken over sometimes, uh, either abandoned or unused, uh, 
locations and they've taken them over and they've converted them into a haunted house attraction that's taken off. I've seen that. And, right. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, yeah. I, but I, that thing about being touched or grabbed or roughed up, I can, I can imagine, I can imagine some guy, this monster touches his girlfriend is like, I want to punch you. <laughs> Hold on. Because, and apparently that happens. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I could, t- I could see where that could go wrong really, really quick. Right. Um, let me ask them, Lisa. I see that you have a book. It's called uh, Monsters of L.A. What is that book about? That book is a collection of sort of intertwined short stories. Um, I, as I mentioned, I grew up watching monster movies, you know, mm-hmm. and I always loved them. And and I'm also a lifelong resident of Los Angeles. And I started thinking about how interesting it would be to take those sort of classic monsters that we all loved and, and put them in these contemporary um, urban settings. Oh, wow. And so when I, as, when I had that thought, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to do 20 of them and I'm going to put them into sort of a framework where they almost crisscross and intertwine and so forth. So that's what that book is. Wow. That is a great idea. So, for example, um, Frankenstein is a uh, Vietnam vet who is homeless and has been patched together um, with all of these surgeries after experiencing all of these terrible things at war. And um, Dracula is an incredibly spoiled, narcissistic movie star who nobody can stand to work with. And um, so the stories range a little bit in tone. There are some that are more comedic, some that are more um, tragic. Um, they I wanted to give people kind of a whole um, emotional ride in that one. That is wonderful um, because it's almost like you're right because a lot of these characters have been sometimes modified for different purposes. Um, as a matter of fact, I was recently watching something that they produced, which is called the Frankenstein Chronicles, and very interesting concept. But it was it was like okay, I didn't know that they were going to take it in this direction. So I know what you mean as far as. Um, sometimes the the way they use the idea but a lot of times they make it a period piece as far as whether it was back in the 17th century or when you know when the first frankenstein came out with um oh my god what's his name now can't believe i uh karloff (laughs) Um, karloff right and um I mean, there's and there's been more modern settings and everything, but um, I I like that. That I think is so super interesting as far as and the vampire. Well, that I don't know how many ways now they could do anything else with vampires or or Dracula, um, except and I know sometimes they want to make it look like let's say the vampire instead of the actual thing of the blood. It's um, they go from making him this like you and I have to that's why I laughed when you said that you used him as a narcissistic um, movie star <laughs> and it was right. like I could so I could so easily see uh, where you get a, a, a movie star that that's exactly like that 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 you can think of the Dracula if you know I it's all for me thank you all for me yeah right and, and um, I wanted to do the idea also in that story that he's being um, he has to compete against the younger actors who are oh coming my. up in the you know the sort of like Twilight kind of versions of vampires. Yeah, something we don't think about much because you know the the, the eternal youth kind of deal. Right. With, uh, and but I guess out there like in Hollywood, yeah, you always got to be looking over your shoulder for the next best younger version of whatever. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's like wow what. And um, as far as Halloween, you 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 wrote an encyclopedia about Halloween. What made you decide to go ahead? With, I mean, obviously you had that background that you loved it, but what what made you decide to put an, an encyclopedia together? Insanity is my immediate answer because. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a kind of thing where I, it was almost an accidental project. I had been working with this publisher on a film book, of all things. And after we finished that book, they said, hey, you know, we, we would love to do another book with you. And do you have any ideas? And so I looked at some cur- 
uh, books that they had published recently, and they had just done a Christmas encyclopedia. Okay. And for some completely insane reason, I thought it would be easy to do a Halloween encyclopedia. I have no idea now why I thought that at the time. <laughs> Um, so I proposed that and they said, that sounds great. And of course it took me about three years. Um, (laughs) a lot more material than you originally thought, huh? There was. And, um, the, the good part about that was that I amassed so much material researching that over those three years that it was easy to roll it over into other books. Um, because when you do an encyclopedic reference, you are kind of limited, of course, by a certain format and, Mm -hmm. um, that format did not lend itself to some of the fabulous stuff I'd gathered. So it was fun to do the other books later on. Right. I understand what you're saying because I imagine once you started researching it is, I guess, what, when you discovered, wow, there's so much more to this than what I originally thought as far as what's generally known about Halloween, I mean. There is. And I'm, one of the interesting things to me about it, and I, I'm sure this is probably true somewhat of most holidays, but it's a holiday that constantly changes. And um, to me, it seems to almost go in a cycle it, that runs about every 40 years. It seems oh, really? to kind of change its identity. So, um, I mean, just over the last hundred years, it has changed remarkably in several times. It kind of went from, um, for example, if you look at the 1910s, Um, 100 years ago. It's a night that is celebrated mainly by prank playing young Mm -hmm. boys. Mm -hmm. There is very little costuming. Trick or treat doesn't exist yet. The adults have kind of, you know, a few of them might throw a party, but it's not a big thing to to them. They they mainly are more concerned with um, repairing their gates in the morning because these boys would disassemble gates and they would tip over outhouses and they would do all kinds of crazy things like that. So, I mean, that's Halloween a hundred years ago. That is so different from what we do now. So yes, it has this fascinating history and it's one of those things that now I've, you know, I've become obsessed with it and I, I'm always finding out new things about it. And, um, so I just, I keep little running folders all the time of new things that I've found out about it. I remember, well, my husband, he's from New Jersey and he's t- telling me one time about mischief night and I'm looking at him and I go, what's mischief night? And he goes, you don't know what mischief night is? And I go, no. And apparently up there in the Northeast, it's like the day before Halloween would, they would do exactly that. Like, and in some cases, right. from what I understand, it would get really out of hand because I said, I need to find out what is Mischief Night. Yeah, and it's interesting that your husband is probably from a very specific part of New Jersey where they called it that because mm-hmm. I have also talked to other people in other parts of the state where they called that Goosey Night. Yes, uh, but yeah, he and, called uh, it Mischief Night, yeah. And then, of course, if you go a little bit farther up to Michigan and Detroit, you get Devil's Night, where it became a very dangerous thing for a while. Um, it became a night of arson. And yes. the pranksters were setting so many fires that they actually were putting serious harm into the city. And the city did manage finally to reverse that. But that was kind of a scary thing for a while, Devil's Night up in Detroit. Yeah. In other words, it wasn't pranks anymore. Uh, right, right. It was uh, destruction and things like that. But yeah, and it's what's really unusual is when he told me, I was like, Mischief Night? Like, it's like particular, I guess, I don't know, up to the north or the northeast United States because I had never even heard of it. And uh, he was like, oh, he he loved it. But it was almost yeah. like, uh, almost like go around and do things you shouldn't, but never destructive, just more like you said, prankish. Uh, the thing with the eggs, which I know can really get irritating. Things like that, but uh, nothing like, like, but, but yeah, I could see where young teenage boys and girls, I'm sure, can end up doing things that it's like, oh, that's not a good idea. Yeah, and it, it, uh, pranking at Halloween has a really long and interesting history. Um, that is not anything that even started like a hundred years ago. I mean, that goes back centuries to the, the Irish who love to play pranks on Halloween because um, I think, and here again, I think that goes back even further. I think the reason they liked playing pranks on Halloween be, was because of the old Celtic notion that mm-hmm. um, it was that time of year when the veil between worlds was at its thinnest and and ghosts and evil spirits and things could cross over on that one night. And so the Irish would play pranks like carve 
the turnip. They didn't have pumpkins, but carve right. a turnip into a glowing demonic face and set it out by the side of a road on Halloween night at a particular curve where the traveler coming along the road wouldn't see it until the last second and be very startled by this glowing face. Or um, one of the funniest ones I ever heard of was the kids would tie strings to the cabbages in a a farmer's cabbage patch and oh. then they would wait for the farmer to come by at dark and they would pull the strings so it looked like the cabbages were walking oh my god yeah i'm sure that i can see it and i want to say that's almost like the age of innocence in a way because um of that type of of things that people would do to one another and i mean i've seen also um it was like a, around the 20s and 30s where people would actually like give each other little cards, like really cute Halloween cards and things like that. It was almost like the holiday, you know, when you give out Christmas cards and things like that. People would give yeah, each other like was, little Halloween cards. They would. It was huge. In fact, the Halloween um, postcards are a big thing in Halloween collecting circles. And I collect those myself and okay. I just love them. Yeah. And uh, they made around 3,000 of those from about 1910 until about 1925. Okay. Um, and they are gorgeous. And there are there are artists who became very famous out of those. And, and some people nowadays will collect just the cards by those artists. Um, oh. So, yeah. And, of course, they died out when the telephone became more popular. Um, they were a, a really common way of communicating before everybody in the U.S. got a phone in their house. Right. And that comes in around 1925, 1927. So then the postcards start to fade in popularity. But they were glorious. Yes. I, 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 I've seen some of them and they're beautiful. I think they're beautiful, but like all things, it has their moment and it goes on its way. Um, let me ask you, have you ever uh, started uh, researching a story and almost found out more as far as, you know? I guess what I'm trying to say is, have you ever had an idea of a story, nonfiction, maybe fiction, and you start maybe doing some research on it and then you find out so much more about it that it almost that one it takes on a life of its own possibly even darker than what you originally thought of as a storyline yeah i think that probably has happened um one of the dangers with that kind of thing though too is that um uh, research can be a really tricky thing to use right in fiction Okay. Um, obviously, it's not a problem in nonfiction, but I don't know about you, but I, I will go nuts if I pick up a book and I start reading, you know, the the uh, floral print had been manufactured in Germany in 1927. And yes. that's it, you can you can read that and you can see where an author has done the research and decided I'm going to use every single solitary bit of it. Um, so to me, that bogs down your story. Uh, there are obviously our authors who do that really well and, and will use most of it and make it really interesting. It, right. I'm not one of those authors. So I tend to do a lot of research and, and then throw away 80% of it. Um, okay. So sometimes I feel like it's important for me as the author to know all of that, but I don't think the reader needs to know every single last little detail of it. Right. In other words, you use it like almost like a behind the scenes as far as the storyline or how you develop the characters or right, right. Or the setting, etc. cetera. Um, right. Do you think, I mean, sometimes, um, for example, uh, I see, and I don't know, I, even though I know it's a, it's a, it seems to be very popular. Personally, I'm not really so much into the horror uh, in the slasher genre, even though I know that's very popular. I don't know if it's because it's realistic or that's one of a lot of people's big fears is that this is not a made up monster. This is a this is somebody that could potentially really exist. In other words, even if the character's made up, uh, what do you think is going to happen as far as the horror genre? Uh, are we going to invent new things new monsters new boogeymen or that's just... it your timing on that question is great because um just last week a week ago today in fact i was in providence rhode island for um the horror writers association's stoker con mm -hmm. and 
that's a topic of discussion that was very popular there. Um, a lot of us feel like we may be sort of in the middle of a new massive revival of interest in horror fiction. Um, last year, certainly at the movie theaters, we saw Get Out and It. Um, right. Just absolutely decimating box office figures, and that, and then Shape of Water coming along, and and these movies doing very well at the awards. Um, I mean, who could ever have imagined that the Academy Awards would recognize horror films for in both directing and screenplay categories? Mm-hmm. That's you know almost unheard of, and and the fact that these movies also did really well with audiences is a fantastic sign, and um, I think it's going to spill over more and more into the publishing world, and we're going to see a lot more really innovative and fresh and and socially relevant um, horror coming along, and I know that that socially relevant part seems to scare a lot of people because somehow people hear that and they think oh it's going to be boring and preachy and all that but right. i mean you know then you just point it get out and you say no that's that's what we're talking about is something that is socially relevant and is fantastic and incredibly entertaining and scary because of that so um i think we're going to see more of that kind of stuff there are a lot of really really cool new authors coming along now and and um by the way i'm kind of with you on slashers um Uh, i mean i I love the original halloween obviously but i got pretty burned out on them really fast um i my theory on why they became so popular for a while is that they were cheap and easy to make um i don't know i just there's something about me that especially these really detailed and graphic it's for me personally i don't get any entertainment out of seeing a person being hurt like that i know i sound like a wimp but i just it's like i end up not looking at that part it's like no (laughs) no no you know if you want to tell me you know one of those quick scenes like okay blood splatter okay i could handle that but when some of these are just too graphic (laughs) Well, and you know, when you're, when you write this stuff and, and you tell people who don't know you, um, every once in a while it'll come up in conversation somewhere. And, and I would always tend to get these, oh, you like blood and guts responses to, I write horror fiction. And it's like, no, I, I actually really don't like blood and guts. I like the stuff that goes around that. Um, I like the mood and the atmosphere and the, the, the legitimate scary things and the way people react to it. And that's what what interests me about the genre not like you're saying you know seeing somebody tortured or mutilated or raped Mm -hmm. or whatever yeah not not my thing either and you know the reason why i also asked you about as far as the 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 future for horror is that you know i don't know if you're familiar with the creepy pasta which is all these like stories that teenagers and adolescents have made up that they've made up these boogeymen and they've taken a life of their own and some of them have been around for years and one of the examples is that slender man who well they had that murder up there of these two girls obviously there's some type of maybe mental illness but uh it's almost like it's i don't want to say an underground genre but uh some of them they it's in, it's incredible how detailed they have developed as far as the characters Oh, yeah, they're fabulous, some of them. Um, yeah, I actually am really familiar with Creepypasta. We we have covered that at our conventions, in fact. Um, and I think it's great seeing these, these young people being creative with this stuff and putting it out there. And, um, and sometimes, you're right, it gets very elaborate. They do movies to go with it and photographs. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Slender Man, I know, started with... Um, essentially two sort of doctored photos that a guy had posted and then the kids picked it up and started writing about it now obviously it's not cool when they go so far as to you know try to murder a a schoolmate uh, because they believe this is real and Mm -hmm. and obviously there was some mental illness involved there i think it had it not been slender man that that girl would have um found some other reason yeah something else and and the other girl who was assisting her with that seemed to just be along because of peer pressure more than anything else but um so yes that's obviously unfortunate but yeah i i i think the creepypasta stuff is very cool yeah they um 
And see, you know, there's always been, you know, adolescence, there's always these, you know, the stories like Bloody Mary, but it was very, it was very uh, minimal. But they've taken on so many different characters uh, and that uh, almost like, um, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you remember that movie, The Ring, that you do something and that's it, you're cursed. You know, this character, whatever it is, will come, you know, after you. And uh, then you have all of them post on different blogs, all these different short, really short, but kind of scary little um, stories. And uh, one time I was I was asking my grandson, I said, Gio, you know, what is this? He goes, oh, you don't know what it's like. You know, you put on your headphones and you sit in your room and it's dark and you listen to these stories and basically you get your pants scared off of you is what he was telling me uh even though uh they're really short and you kind of almost know what to expect as far as what's going to develop from the story but yeah they they really they really get into that I guess. yeah and i i think that stuff is really interesting on a on a sort of sociological level because it's it's modern folklore mm-hmm. um and in fact, there are, I've even read some fairly academic treatises in which they have now called that net lore. Really? Um, so that is, yes, it's like the modern version of folk tales and folklore. And I think that's really, really interesting. Right. And, and of course, you know, um, you know, we could, we could even go into that all of this is produced by the information that they've received as children, you know, like almost like it's, they they extract these ideas out of the horror movies or things that have come out before that. It's just their own version sure. of it. Yeah. And like you said, that they've doctored that copy and paste thing uh, as far as making up. And and one of the things that I thought um, that you said about is like let's say Slenderman. I I, f- I believe that one of the things is that he lures children and he does away with them. I think to myself, this right. is a real fear. I guess that you know kids have or adolescents have as far as be, being a real fear even though they right. they use the slender man thing but um i think that's when you you're absolutely right as far as uh it kind of even though it's made up it's a good reflection of what's going on society wise as far as with adolescents uh they're you know they're expressing their fears and right. I, in a way i guess that's a good thing that's a good thing um now, what was the? Um, also, I've noticed, and uh, I don't know how much you're into. There, there. I've also seen like a lot of trends as far as blending like sci-fi horror, like a dystopian future, but almost like a a, a meshing of both ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Cross genre is getting bigger all the time. That there again, that's one of those things we talked a lot about at the convention last week. Um, and yes, the the dystopian thing i mean even the sort of zombie stuff is yes. quite often a sci-fi horror uh, mashup um there's a lot of interesting work coming out along those lines and and i think maybe we're going to see more blending other genres too um horror and mystery uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the thrillers that are being put out right now i mean the stuff that gillian flynn writes to me works great as horror mystery um cross genre stuff so right um yeah, it's the. I think that's really exciting too. That's another one of the trends in the the coming future of horror that I think is going to be out there and big and very exciting. Right. I mean, it's almost because at one point I'm not going to say all the time, but like you said, there was a real more of a delineation. You had the pure sci-fi or the pure fantasy, and then true crime, and then everybody kind of stayed off. And maybe every once in a while you would get something that would cross over, but. Um, yeah, you, you're. I see it more and more often sometimes with some of the ideas, and I, I'm that thing about zombies. Who would have said zombies were gonna take off the way they did because they had already been around for a while. Yeah, <laughs> and all of a sudden, it just like. Um, let me ask, and, and I'm gonna, uh, uh, I'm gonna use the example of The Walking Dead. Obviously, the backdrop is the zombies, you know, or a disease that's taken over, made people zombies is the backdrop. I, I sometimes I watch that and is it I'm thinking, is it the zombie thing, the fear of whatever it is of a disease? Is it the that they're 
giving the example of what happens with all these characters when all the rules and norms that we have in society kind of like fall, they leave? Is this what people do? I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes I look at it, I don't know which way to go on that. But it's all I, about well, zombies. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Yeah, the zombie thing is interesting because obviously post-apocalyptic, I can I can totally get a lot of people feel like we're not moving in a good direction, that mm -hmm. end times are coming. I mean, that also plays into sort of um, Christian fundamentalist right. fears, um, the rapture, the end times, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And um, so I certainly can see where the whole obsession with um, the dystopian future stuff comes in. The zombie part is really interesting because it, right. it, I have actually thought a lot about why it is that we do have this obsession with these things. And, and there's certainly a sort of fear of conformity, I think, that's built in, that right. you, you die and you become the same as everyone else. You're just this shuffling, mindless thing that, exist only to eat um so i think that is certainly a fear that seems to play in there um and then on the other side there's a sort of fun aspect of it which is that you knew, do as you just mentioned marlene you now live in a society where the rules don't apply anymore and you have to fend for yourself and um you have to count on your your survival instincts and that's very appealing of course to a lot of people well, I think also that um, if you look at it, I think it's almost like when you watch it, it's almost like that message, like you really don't know what you're capable of because we all try to think of ourselves, you know, as, as long as you're not a psychopath, that is, that, you know, we wouldn't kill another human being, that we would be incapable of doing all these things. And it's almost like that's like a big, like, not real like you really don't know what you're capable of doing if you're put under those circumstances which is survival right. including you know killing other people in really horrific ways because that's exactly what happens uh like right. in other words if you have to survive really uh all the rules disappear right yeah and I think there's a part of that that's very appealing to us on some level. Um, you know, you, you have one of those days where it's like you stood in line at the bank and the guy cut you off on the freeway and whatever. And you end up thinking, wow, I just I wish I could go after that guy who cut me off on the freeway. And I think maybe that at some point morphs into, hey, it's OK to shoot this guy in the head because he's a zombie. Uh, you know, it's almost like, yeah, we're too nice and too civilized. Yeah, right. but <laughs> but yeah, I, I when I, when that thing with the zombie things, you know, that it morphed into so many other different versions of it. I was like, okay, I mean, I I get it as far as the 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 scary part, uh, whether because you know in some versions it's there's like almost a paranormal aspect. The other one is that it's some type of um, nothing paranormal. In other words, it's a it's a disease. It's an illness right. that affects right. us. Right. Just you just want to eat human flesh. That's all. And um, I can, and, and I looked at, it and I was like, okay, I could see some of the fear part in it, but it's like, what, what's, what's there? It's like, who, who's really scarier, the zombies or the humans that are left behind? That kind of deal. Sure, because they've got yeah, a few psychopaths running around there in these shows, but. <laughs> And I think that was something that George Romero did brilliantly in his yes. movies, and I think that's obviously the fact that somebody as smart as Romero. Uh, made the first few zombie movies contributed gigantically to their ongoing popularity. Um, I, I mean, you got to love like the original Dawn of the Dead, which is the ultimate consumer capitalist society parody in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I, I'm and he made everything was made on a very small budget. It's talk about like, you know, right, minimalist. Yeah. Uh, pro uh, production, I imagine it's like, from what I understand, this was, in other words, there, he, he had no idea that this was going to become a cult classic, in other words. Right, right. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, uh, and of course, a lot of these things you don't realize it for what it is till maybe 10, 20, 30 years have passed and you look back at what was happening at that time and so on and so forth. And there's more of a, more than just the horror flick going on um let me ask you do you do you have any new books are, are you do you have any projects right now that you're working on um yeah there are always things i'm working on some of them are things i can't really talk much about yet okay, but um 
we're still, you know, in that phase where you're waiting for contracts to come through and so forth. But I will be doing a, um, I'll be co-editing an anthology of classic ghost stories with my friend Leslie Klinger. Okay. Um, I'm really excited about that. If you don't know the name Leslie Klinger, you should check out his annotated books. He just brought out um, last year both the annotated Frankenstein and the annotated Watchmen. Oh, um, okay. Which his books are gorgeous and they're amazing. So that's going to be fun. We're going to do annotations, of course, on uh, classic ghost stories. And you were mentioning earlier some of them. Yes. We'll be doing like the M.R. James and the Edith yes. Wharton's and so forth. Yes. Um, so we hope we can maybe make those exciting to a whole new generation well, I, of I people mean, again. I, I, there's some of them that are, they're really, I mean, some of them you read them and they're good, but they're not as scary. But there's others that you read, uh, like E.F. Benson. Uh, some of these authors that, like you said, if you'd say right. their names now, everybody will look at you and go, who? You know, and it's like, this This is a great, This is, he had some great books, short stories. Um that uh, even uh, for example H.G. Wells you know a lot of people know H.G. Wells because of course uh, Time Machine and The Island of Dr. Moreau but he wrote also a couple of ghost stories out there as well yeah. a lot yeah, of these authors did. did things that most people don't realize that they actually wrote and are really really good and right. um, yeah I, I, I like discovering these stories uh, that when you read them you're like, wow. You know, when you finish reading them, even when you're reading them, you're like, wow. Uh, and um, and I guess that's what I was saying at the beginning. Uh, they they have either horror, suspense, pending. But it was, a lot of it also was left as to the imagination, your imagination. Like, in other words, they knew how to prod your imagination along so that you're like, oh, God. <laughs> you know what's going to happen next or uh when they come to the end you know what what is the the resolution or the explanation a lot of times also they left that question mark as in right there is no real answer or explanation right. as to what happened but uh yeah i, I i'm a I, i'm glad that that something along those lines is going to be brought out i mean i know there's a lot of anthologies and stuff like that but sometimes you find that they're more recent authors versus some of these earlier ones um, as far as uh, that they're being collected. And I think they're overlooked. And for and I'm going to make a perfect example. Like you said, M.R. James, a lot of people know who M.R. James is because he's just a well-known and he's gotten that reputation for all these fantastic ghost stories. But he had a lot of contemporary authors um, that wrote in my opinion, stories that were just as good as his. Uh, scary stories, too. Right. You know, not, uh, like I and said. And some, some of them, um, yeah, some of them are a little bit trapped in the time period. And once mm -hmm. you kind of get into the swing of it and work your way through some of the conventions of that time, there are some amazing things. I mean, one of my favorites is a thing called The Willows by mm -hmm. Algernon Blackwood. And The Willows starts with a long passage that you just think, oh, what is this? It's It was part of a sort of tradition at that point of travelogues. Okay. Um, they a lot of the authors knew that they were writing for people who could not easily get out and see these different places and they would include these extended um travel descriptions in the books you get some of that in dracula too okay. and um the willow starts with like 10 pages of these guys making their way down this river and you just think oh when is this going to end <laughs> when it does end and gets into the story the story is fantastic and as you're saying it's one of The okay. and what's happening, but it's creepy. I highly recommend if you haven't read that, go. F uh, well, um, well, the other Find day, I, I'm sorry. What was what was the name of what was the name of the author again, or what was the name of the title of the of the story? Oh, I think I'm losing you, Lisa. Uh oh. Okay. The willows. The willows. Am I okay. there? Yeah, I, right, I lost okay. you there for a minute. Okay. So, so yeah, go go for it. Like the it's in other words, it's got a uh, uh it's kind of a little bit slow at the beginning, but then once you're into it, you're like, "Wow, this is great." Exactly. Yeah. And uh yeah. you know who the other day I was and 
I, when I read it, I was like, wow, I can't believe this. Um, I read something, a ghost story um, by uh, the lady that ran, wrote Anne of Green Gables, of all things, <laughs> Ellen Montgomery. Oh. Whoa. And, and she wrote some ghost stories. And I was like, wow, this is really good. <laughs> I mean, they're not, I would say, superb, but they were really good. And I was like, Anne of Green Gables? Really? Oh, but that's really great. You, yeah. Hey, so you stumped the expert on that one. Now I got to go out and find those. Yeah. I was like, I was really surprised when I came across that. And one of the last ones, this is um, a more modern uh, writer. And uh, his name is Carl Edward Wagner. He's, he's, I think he's already passed away. And uh, he's one that he's more modern. And uh, his, his horror stories are really, really good. I mean, same thing almost where that build up that yeah you you're, you're seeing it's going in that direction but it's great it's because it's like okay i'm waiting for that moment so yeah he's fantastic yeah he he did pass away sadly about now i think it was about 12 15 years ago yeah. but yeah he was a major talent yeah his um and he wrote i know what was it uh he uh didn't uh, i think he put together also some anthologies and things like that right i'm not sure i'm i'm I've only he read... did. He was doing uh, the year's best horror for a while. Oh, okay, 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 and um, yeah, I, I. What I guess what I want as far as when I read him, it, he's, he he's easy to read, and I don't want to make it sound. It's like you know one of these stories that brings you in, and you're going with it, and it's easy to comprehend to put yourself in that story. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I I really liked his style a lot. Yeah, he's terrific. Um, well, anyway, Lisa, thank you so, so much for spending this time with me. It has been fantastic. I look forward to that collection that you're going to put together. I can't wait to see it because, as you could tell, I am always looking for what I call those hidden gems of horror stories or suspense, ghosts. It doesn't have to even be ghosts. It's just those stories that sometimes, of course, because there's so many stories that come out that if they're not current, they kind of fall by the wayside and people forget about them. Right. And they're right. really, really well, good. I hope you will find some of those gems in this collection. Yes, yes. Uh, what is that going to be coming out? I, You know, it's, uh, I think, not until October of this year. Okay. Um, and uh, even that, I, they might push that back a little bit. I'm still, okay. that one's, uh, it's going to be done with a company called Pegasus Books. And they do really wonderful books. So um, okay. that should be really nice when that comes out. And there are, like I said, there are other things that are in the the very early stages that I really. I know, I understand. Anything I about, totally so. understand what you mean as far as that there's certain things you can't talk about. I totally understand where you're coming from with that. But again, I want to thank you so much. I'm going to put a link to your website on the credits. Uh, and of course, I've had a slide here with the covers of some of your uh, books that you've more recent books. So uh, I imagine what that uh, can they find these books on your website or anywhere else? They sure can. Yeah, there's I've got an Amazon authors page. They're mm -hmm. on my website. So yeah, they're they're pretty easy to find. Fantastic. Again, thank you so much, Lisa, and have a fantastic week and you've been great. Oh, thanks so much, Marlene. This was fun. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. Uh, you know what? I just... I... And she, let me tell you something. If you, This is the lady that not only does she write the books, as you could tell, she's involved with all these different groups and clubs where all these... Uh, authors it's almost like a think tank kind of deal in a way even though it's a very short time I imagine if they're getting together for a convention maybe a weekend where you know they're discussing what is going to be happening with the genre uh, yes you have your classics and then you have a version of the classic you know there's you know I, I think like in all things you know you 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 always build on what's come before and it's really interesting I think to see to see where this is going to go, where this is going to go as far as yes, you honor the classics, you maybe build on them or use them or take those characters and run with them, 
Or like what I was saying, this thing with the creepy pastas, that these things have totally mushroomed and sprung out of modern day uh, stories, uh, imaginations, um, fears, whatever you want to call them. And uh, and I personally, I, once I started looking into it, I was surprised at how long some of them had been around. Like, like it's like they take on a life of their own, and they're being everybody passes it along. Um, and I was surprised to find that some of them are even they've been around for like a few years in some cases. As uh, as far as um, and it's and I'm not kidding. I I mean it's almost like an underground. When I started researching it, it was like, yeah, Marlene, you're like, you're out there in ignorance land when it comes to creepy pastas. And then I started asking around like the right people, as in teenagers, and they're like, yeah, and this and this and this character, and it does this and that and that. And I was like, huh? Like where have I been? I've been, I guess, in adult land. <laughs> But, uh, and uh, I personally, I think um, a lot of these, uh, you know, young teenagers that write all these stories, even though, like I said, they're short on blogs and, you know, some of them are made up, some of them are real, kind of. And I I think that's great because I can see that. If I had had this back when I was a teenager, I would have been there blogging away, you know, putting together these stories or these experiences because, like I said, I, I love a good scare. I love a good scare. Again, I'm not really into seeing people chopped up or tortured or anything like these really super graphic slasher films. It's not my thing. Uh, and I was lucky. Let me tell you something. One of the things that I think that people miss out on is... Uh, when I was a teenager or younger, uh, drive-ins were still popular, you know, and you would have families that would, you know, especially if you had a, like a bigger, like a station wagon. Yeah. <laughs> like when station wagons were around and, uh, you would take your pillow and you would take your things and everything's, you know, double feature, of course, because there's no such thing as one movie. And I remember going Friday nights, my mom would take me and sometimes my cousin and everything. And we would go see these really like, most of the times they were like B-movies of all these like scary, one of them, which has become a cult classic, is like, let's scare Jessica to death. I remember seeing that. I was like, oh my God, it was great. It was fantastic because you got scared and maybe for the next day, but that was it. It wasn't like like when I saw The Exorcist. I spent like two months sleeping in my mom's bed. I was like, I don't want to go to my room. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I totally understand where Lisa's coming from when she says, "Well, I grew up seeing, uh, you know, where this was great." And and I and I I remember that. And I think I think I think we should have it. I wish they had drive-ins again. <laughs> Even though I know some of these dinner theaters are coming back, but that whole idea was fun also and I mean that's the thing with Halloween don't get me wrong I, I know it's different but personally I think we've kind of lost a little bit of the fun of Halloween I remember going trick-or-treating all the way until I was a teenager and it was a blast yeah later on when I was like 18 or 19 and you know you go to parties and things and you have a you know you dress up and you go there but I remember Halloween was such a great time from a kid up uh you know you put together your your costume. I remember even my mom. Uh, my birthday's in October, so she dressed me up for almost like when I was a year old. She dressed me up like a little witch. She did like a little put together. It was like, like she said, you know, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't. I, I don't know so much fear around it as what's been done in modern times. At least where I live, you see a lot of activities put together for kids, almost to not have them go out on the street and trick or treat. And I have. I've seen it. It's declined, at least where I live out here in Miami, where, you know, sometimes I overbuy, well, I didn't know I was overbuying candy, but I'm left with so much candy because before you would see kids like all over, you'd see them up and down the block on one side of the street, on the other, and it's like hardly no kids. And of course, they'll walk with their parents, which is fine. Absolutely. That's the way it should be. But few and far between, few and far between. Because like I said, another show, another thing that I would love to do is I would love to scare the kids. 
I would sit with a sheet draped over me, like right next to the door. And I know how to sit really still, by the way. And I would put this big bowl of candy on my lap. And these kids, you would see they would come up and they would be like, no, it's not. You hear them whispering, no. See, of course, I have it over my head. They can't, I can't, can't see it. No, it's real. Is it real? No, it's not real. It's not real. And you know, they're coming. And it, of course, the way I had it, I could tell when either they knocked on the door or when I see their hands coming to the bowl to get the candy. And when I moved, you want to see kids grow wings on their heels. That's the moment. Oh, my God, even teenage. Oh! You know, then, of course, the little, little kids, they would be on the fence telling mommy, I don't want to go in. Of course, I'd give them candy because, but I had a blast doing that as an adult. And I don't get that anymore because, unfortunately, like I said, um, that's not the norm anymore. Like I said, they just have these places where you get together and you take your kid with a costume and it's safe. And that's, I want to say that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate because, especially, um, I want to say, let me let me get on my soapbox and then I'll get off shortly. Um, you know what? Especially with a lot of what we see nowadays with the, uh, you know, too much time on the computers, especially with kids and teenagers and uh, all this social media stuff. It's like, isn't it great to actually just go out and walk around and interact with the humans and talk and just walk around it was I, I remember there was even times it would rain and I, we, we went out even if it was sprinkling and you just had a good time uh like I said there's ways to be safe obviously especially if you're younger you know you always have an adult that's walking with a group of children and would never let them um go into some place that didn't appear to be safe and you know when I was growing up yeah we had those you know rule like you know, don't eat anything until you get home. So, you know, we'd spill it out and my mom would look at everything. But sometimes it wasn't even so much about getting the candy. It was about the trick-or-treating part, you know. And if you came up on a house that was decorated and it was scary and, yeah, it was, uh, like I said, uh, I think it's unfortunate that's been diminished a little bit. Yeah, you get a lot of the decorations and, and you go to these places and they have these big inflatables and it's fantastic. But, it's almost like they've scared the happiness and the good times out of the Halloween, um, out of the Halloween holiday. Uh, so anyway, guys, I hope you like the show. Please subscribe so that you get to know when I release a show, get notifications, whether you're seeing the show or you're listening to it on podcast version, catch me live streaming on um, Facebook and on Twitter via Periscope. If you're one of my true believers, don't forget me. I've gotten a lot of fantastic stories, and I would like to get some more. Uh, go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com and go to the Submit Your Story tab. It offers you a lot of different, how can I say it? Um, you can either email me, uh, you can tape yourself, you can, you know, with your phone or just talk, or if you don't want to do that, we could get together and I'll tape you just like what I did right now. Okay, and I'll edit it for whatever it is you want. Uh, and I've said it before, it doesn't have to be true. It could be a story, it could be an urban myth, it was something you heard, something your family's talked about. Uh, just a good story. All right, doesn't have to be about ghosts, it could be about anything, anything. Okay, if it gives you a good chill, I want to hear from you. So guys, again, thank you so very much for coming back, being part of my audience. And I think you are all wonderful. Take care.